Good morning. I'm Kaushal Chari, Dean of UWM's Lubar School of Business. I'm so delighted to welcome you to today's Artificial Intelligence and Analytics Symposium. The Lubar School is very proud to offer this webinar to the public, sharing the expertise of top academics and executives and our own outstanding faculty on the latest in both research and practice in AI and analytics. The webinar is sponsored by the Lubar School's Center for Technology Innovation, which fosters a community of faculty, business leaders, and students to explore the opportunities offered by innovative technologies such as AI, machine learning, and big data. And through public programs like today's symposium and its long-standing workshop series, the center seeks to promote discussions that lead to solutions in the information technology environment. I'm now happy to turn the program over to Dr. Atish Sina, uh, Professor of Information Technology Management and the Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Lubar School of Business. Uh, Dr. Sina is an expert in business intelligence, service-oriented systems and connected systems. Atish, thank you for organizing today's symposium. We are really looking forward to all the insights from our experts in the spheres of AI and analytics. Atish, over to you. Thanks, Dean Chari. Warm welcome to all of you. And uh, it's a very exciting program today. We have 170 people who have registered from all across the country. Uh, before we start, just to mention that uh, for the attendees, you cannot directly ask questions, so your microphones are muted, but there's a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. You can post questions uh, during the session and the speakers will try to address those questions. If you look at the agenda, as I said, it's a very exciting program. We have two keynote addresses and two panels. The first keynote will start in a minute. And uh, after this keynote, we have an industry panel and at 11 o'clock, we'll have a short break for 15 minutes. Then we'll have the second keynote at 11.15, and the second panel, which is going to be an academic panel, at 12.15. Okay. Now, the first uh, keynote, Dr. Ahmed Abbasi is going to present uh, how to develop a research program in human-centered AI. Dr. Abbasi is a Giovanni Endowed Chair Professor in the Mendoza College of Business, University of Notre Dame. He's also the co-director of the Human-Centered Analytics Lab. Dr. Abbasi received his PhD from the AI lab at the University of Arizona. I've known him for over 12 years now. And if you look at his vita, he has over 20 years of experience in AI, working mainly in the areas of healthcare, online fraud and security, text mining, and social media. His research has been funded by several organizations, including the NSF, Microsoft, eBay, and Oracle. He has published close to 100 articles in major journals and conferences, okay? and his work has been featured in various media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, AP, Wired, CBS, and Fox. Dr. Abbasi is currently the senior editor for information systems research, one of the top journals in our field, and is also the chair of the Informs College on AI. It's my honor to invite Dr. Abbasi to present the first keynote address. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sina, and thank you, uh, Dean Chari, for, for having me here. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. I Actually, uh, UWM is a place that's very near and dear to me because I started my academic career there, and our uh, firstborn child was, was born in Milwaukee. So we're very, uh, it's kind of nice to be back, if you will. Uh, we do miss cops, frozen custard, and the beautiful uh, commute to work uh, along Lakeshore Drive. So it's, it's, it's an honor to be here. And so I'm going to share my screen now. And basically, the, the title of my talk is called Developing a, a 
research program in uh, research in, in human centered AI. And, and basically, what I'm going to try to focus on in, in this talk is this notion that I, I think that you know, business schools are very well positioned to offer a lot of thought leadership around uh, AI and, and analytics. And given that this is a Lubar School of Business uh, sponsored uh, symposium with uh, led by the IT uh, management department and others, I, I think that the focusing on sort of what, what business schools can offer is, is interesting. And this is sort of a, a journey that we've been going through over the last year at the University of Notre Dame, where we're thinking, you know, I'm in the Mendoza College of Business, and we're thinking about, you know, what can we do? And in fact, this, uh, the ideas I'm going to share are, are sort of the basis for a new lab that we started, a human-centered analytics lab, and, and which works closely with our um, ethics centers, as well as our data science, uh, data and society uh, institute, and is also the basis for a new PhD program that we're going to be launching or we're launching next year in the analytics uh, here uh, in our IT department at the business school. So in terms of uh, what I'm going to talk about, it's really, I think, and design is really at the core of this. And I think this is something that business schools do well. In fact, uh, Dr. Sinha, who just introduced me, is he's done a lot of work around design for analytics, uh, as has that entire department. And even uh, Dean Chari, who's done a lot of work around design. So, so I think this is a concept that should hopefully resonate. And for some of you, this might seem uh, like I'm stating the obvious, but, but uh, hopefully it will be valuable for some, some of the folks. So in terms of what I'm going to talk about, I'll start with my journey, my AI journey. Uh, as uh, Dr. Sin alluded to, I've been working in this space for about uh, 20 years. And I, you know, I'll sort of talk about how I arrived at these conclusions and some of the projects I worked on along the way and, and how it led me to this area. I'm then going to talk about this AI paradigm shift and how things have changed dramatically really in the last five to 10 years for, for certain, certain areas. And in fact, uh, I, I was looking at the program and I saw that Dr. Sheng, uh, Olivia Sheng is going to be giving the, the second keynote. So I, I hope that uh, this talk will segue nicely into what she's going to talk about. So she's going to focus a lot on the value, uh, you know, value by design idea. How do we put value at the center of analytics? And so I'm going to talk, I'm not going to quite focus on that as much, but, but I think it'll segue nicely. Uh, and so once I talk about this idea of human-centered AI, I'll talk about a couple of projects that we're working on in, in the health and, and uh, security space uh, around this, as well as some of the university-wide AI efforts that we have at Notre Dame and how what we're doing in the business school uh, and connects with that, as well as with industry and other, other things. Okay. So if you have any questions, as Dr. Sin alluded to, feel free to pop them in the chat, and I'll, I'll try to get to those as, as much as I can. And I'll try to leave a few minutes at the end as well for questions. All right, so without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so before we get into, before we say anything, it's important to say, you know, define AI. And well, what do we mean, right? And, and AI is a very, very broad topic that's been around for many, many, many years. Um, and so my focus in most of my work is, is in a pretty narrow space within AI. And so, you know, back when we used to go to the malls, and we don't really quite do that as much anymore, uh, I was one of those people that would always get lost. So I needed to go find the map where it said you are here. And so I'm going to kind of do that here right now to sort of define AI, right? So sort of our you are here is, is right here. And so what that means is I'm going to be focusing really on predictive machine learning and, and where, you know, data uh, deep learning, which is really one of the more state of the art things that's come up in the last 10, 15 years has really disrupted AI. So I'm going to focus on that really for, for the purpose of my, my, my talk today. And this of course relates to other areas of AI and data science and so forth. So, so that this is where we are today for when I say AI. And in terms of my, my journey, so I right out of undergrad, I started working uh, on Wall Street and I was doing we were working for a startup, and our main client was uh, HSBC, Hong Kong, Shanghai Banking Corporation. And what we used to do was uh, our job was to, to provide some fraud detection capabilities on wire transfers as well as letter of credit operations, right? So this is 100 Wall Street. We had a, an, an office on the 26th floor of that building. 
And what we were doing was we were primarily uh, using neural nets uh, to do fraud detection. And so my job was to use genetic algorithms uh, to tune them. So genetic algorithms are this sort of uh, optimization method for NP-hard problems, uh, which are not easy to solve using other techniques. And so it's a very AI uh, circa 1990s, right? And as I was working in this space, 9-11 uh, happened and suddenly the, what we needed to do for fraud detection changed dramatically. The, the, the stakes were much higher because uh, money laundering and other types of fraud were, you know, getting it right was much more important even uh, than before. And as part of that, as we started thinking about ways to, to make our detection methods better, we started looking at, well, how can we leverage the text? How can we leverage the images and so forth? And this desire to incorporate the unstructured data into this, into these models made, made me realize that, okay, I, I don't quite have the training. I, by then I'd finished my MBA. And so I decided, you know, I needed to, I needed to, to get more deeper into this. Uh, so I moved to the University of Arizona and I joined the artificial intelligence lab there where I worked on some industry projects and also pursued my PhD. And so when I moved to Arizona, one of the big projects that was going on there was called uh, Coplink, right? So Coplink, and it had just been featured in Newsweek and apologies, I just realized that the picture is a bit morbid, but uh, uh, at the time, if you recall, this is around 2003, there was uh, the sniper shooting the, the incidents that were happening in sort of the Southeastern mid-Atlantic and Southeast US. And so it, at, at the time, and, and it, it, the idea was that if we have better uh, crime analytics, it could help prevent some of these types of serial uh, sniper shooting type incidents. And so Coplink was at the time Newsweek did this article, it was called Google for Cops. And basically Coplink had two components to it, right? The first component, was called Coplink Connect. And so this is very, those of you with a background in IT, this is very classic information technology. It's about how do we integrate data? How do we build these cloud-based data warehouses and do basic business intelligence, right? With our reporting and whatnot. And in this case, it was essentially uh, sharing data across different jurisdictions, across different agencies, and, and also allowing more real-time access in, you know, in the police cars and mobile and so forth, right? So this was sort of coupling connect. And, and uh, the other part though was, and I should point out that coupling is even today, it's been used, you know, it's used in about 35 states in the United States. And, you know, it's a very, very powerful uh, tool that, that helps with law enforcement because it breaks down information asymmetries. The other component to coupling Beyond Connect was what was called Coplink Detect, right? And so with Coplink Detect, the idea was to use more predictive analytics, right? So whereas Connect was focused on descriptive analytics and reporting, Detect was all about prediction, right? And one of the really classic use cases was uh, in the southwestern United States, in Arizona and California and parts of Texas, there is a lot of... Uh, Across, there was a lot of cross-border drug uh, uh, movement and smuggling. And so for Customs and Border Protection, where there are thousands of vehicles every hour that cross this border and, and for, for, for you know, legitimate commerce and, and work and so forth, how do you sort of, can, can we use prediction to better uh, identify which vehicles need to be uh, need further like scrutiny, right? So because smugglers have all these really complex patterns that are following. So this is what would be called, you know, this is coupling detect, and there's all kinds of predictive models that we were using to try to detect these things. So this was cool, and I, you know, I finished my PhD, and then of course I moved to uh, Milwaukee, uh, to wonderful, wonderful Wisconsin, and and so I wasn't as involved with coupling after that. But what's interesting is again, it's it's been very, you know, it's done really well. Yeah, but, but at the time, one of the things that we didn't frankly focus on enough, which, which now in hindsight and, and more recently has become very critical and important is this notion that, okay, as we're doing prediction, what are the potentially broader implications of that, right? And so I don't know if, if you guys have seen this movie called Minority Report, Steven Spielberg directed it, it's about 20 years old uh, now. So if I, if I mention this to my undergrads, they have no idea what I'm talking about. 
But Minority Report was this movie. The idea was that, well, if we, if we predict uh, crime, it's sort of this pre-crime prediction idea uh, where this ball would come out and it would have the name of someone that was potentially going to commit a crime. Uh, yeah, the notion was, well, what happens when you get it wrong, right? And, and what, what are the implications of false positives and so forth? And these are things we certainly talked about and, and incorporated, but perhaps not to, this, to the extent that we probably needed to at the time. And not unsurprisingly, a few years ago, and, and in many places across the U.S., uh, technologies such as Coplink, specifically Coplink Detect, have, have now are, are not being used as much. So here's an example from a town hall in Boston in 2018, where specifically um, they voted to to not to, 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 to make sure that the police would not use Coplink uh, Detect any longer because of potential issues around the governance of it. So here's an example of a technology that was very cool, right? And was doing really neat things and, and really pushing the boundary. And, and so it sort of went through this life cycle where now where we're asking these deeper questions, really important questions about its use. And this sort of brings me to what I think is the paradigm shift in AI, right? So the paradigm shift that's happened with AI, and this is why I think business schools need to be at the forefront of this, is that it's, it's using consulting speak. Those of you that have worked in consulting are going to apologize if you are appalled by this, but things have moved from the art of the possible, which is what can we do and is it even possible, right? So regarding, let's take an example of Coplink and there's many other examples of image recognition and NLP and so forth, where 20, 30 years ago, what we could do was very basic. So a lot of our questions in research and, and whether it's an industry R&D or in academia were about this, the art of the possible. Now, things have shifted to the art of the practical and the art of the valuable. And so what the art of the practical, specifically what I mean by this is, should we do it? And how do we do it right? So practical isn't just, is it tech, you know, technologically feasible, but sort of from a societal perspective, from a governance standpoint, thinking about the implications more broadly. And then when we do that, we get into the valuable, humanistic out outcomes and implications for society. Uh, and I'm not going to talk too much about the valuable because I know Dr. Shang is going to be doing a, a really excellent talk about the value around analytics. And it's obviously critical. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about business value, but, but now I think we, we understand that value means something a little bit more, more broader. Uh, but this is really where the, we think, I think the, the, the big questions and the big opportunities are for thought leadership is, is this practical, this whole value chain, if you will, from possible to practical to value. And to sort of uh, the catalyst for this, I think, is something that happened uh, two years ago, even just sort of highlighted it. So two years ago, as we're thinking about this paradigm shift, and again, I know paradigm shift is a very sort of a cliched term. Uh, it was way cool in the 1950s when the, the book came out, but, but since then we've used it, abused it. But so sorry for some of the cliched uh, terminology in the, in the talk. But two years ago, something really interesting happened, something I would say unprecedented. And what, what, what happened was uh, the Turing Award winners were the three godfathers of deep learning, right? So basically the Turing Award, I'm, I'm assuming some of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, it's uh, obviously named after Alan Turing, who is considered one of the pioneers in AI. And he's uh, also the, a, a really interesting movie about him called The Imitation Game, starring uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, if you haven't seen that, it came out a few years ago. But basically he's one of the people that helped crack the, the U-boat, uh, the, the code, uh, if you will, using machines to do it, right? Now, so the Turing Award, it's sort of like the Nobel Prize for Computer Science or the, or the Fields Medal in math. It, it's the, the highest honor. And sorry, I think I see I'm getting a question here. Oh, sure. Um, yes, I'm happy to share the, yes, happy to share the, the deck with folks. All right. The, so the Turing Award is uh, this, again, sort of like the Nobel Prize for Computing and uh, two years ago, in 2019, we, we saw the, these three gentlemen won it. Jan LeCun, uh, Jeff Hinton, and Joshua Bengio, right? So these three gentlemen won the Turing Award. 
And here's why this is really in interesting. This is intriguing for several reasons. The first reason is that if you think about machine learning methods, this is one of the first times that has that type of a contribution has won the Turing Award, right? So anyone who's worked in the analytics space, we know that predictive machine learning has been around for a long time. Uh, there's nothing really new with just basic neural nets anymore. Those have been around for many, many years. Uh, decision trees, Ross Quinlan probably developed the algorithm, the core algorithm for that um, in the 1980s. It's been cited 100,000 times plus. Uh, Vapnik developed statistical learning theory, which is the basis for support vector machines. Again, a very powerful machine learning model that um, a lot of my dissertation work and my, my academic papers use that method, in fact. He's been cited like 250,000 times or whatnot, and is uh, and even that is you know didn't didn't get the award for that. There have been a few awards for AI contributions, but this is the first time a machine learning sort of method or platform like this has won the award, and and that's important. And so then the question becomes, well, why 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 are they winning it? What happened? Uh, so that's one thing. Another interesting thing is the affiliations that these gentlemen have, right? So if you look at it. Yan LeCun is the chief data scientist at Facebook. Jeff Hinton is a fellow at Google. Joshua Bengio, who's this gentleman right here, is uh, he has a startup called Element AI, which is um, the major backer of that is Microsoft. And then finally, Ian Goodfellow, who was Joshua Bengio's student at the University of Montreal, he is now, I think, the chief data scientist for Apple. So, this is very interesting because we have these gentlemen that won this award, and then you look at the industry connections that they have, uh, arguably, and we know how uh, tech companies have become the drivers, right? The fangs and the so forth companies are now uh, what, what the manufacturing companies were. So these companies are, to, in our time, what GE was in the 1990s, right? And, and what uh, these other techs were in terms of value creation and, and revenue and so forth. So you see this really strong connection between science and industry, uh, like in some, in, in some ways unprecedented, but what's happened. And then the other thing that's interesting, of course, there's, we should also mention as a, being an academic, it's intriguing that many of them are connected with institutions in Canada. And that's not an accident either. Canada has done an amazing job of investing in AI over the last 20, 25 years. And in fact, the US fortunately is also now uh, following that model, and we're seeing a lot more investment in with the National Science Foundation and whatnot in AI. So this is hopefully we're going to uh, reap some of the benefits of what what they've done there as well. So that's a couple of reasons it's interesting. But then you also still say, okay, this is really cool, but you know, this deep learning is it just hype? Is it you know, what's going on? And another measure, and this is a very academic thing. So if you're from industry, you're going to probably scratch your head a little bit. But another one important measure of uh, research and you know, whether something is really being adopted is citations. You know, how much are other articles citing and, and, and incorporating the ideas from previous research, right? In industry, we see this with patents, how much a patent gets cited. That's a, bit, a way to measure innovation. Same thing here with research. And so I mentioned that in your academic career, if you get cited, you know, 10,000 times, that's really good. Uh, I'm hoping to get there someday. Uh, if you get cited 100,000, 200,000, these are some of the, you know, the top people in the field and some of the most critical computer science machine learning type folks have only gotten a couple hundred thousand sites. The Google Scholar, if you look at Google Scholar, uh, the citation totals for these four gentlemen, if you add it up, it's over 1.2 million. Now, Ian Goodfellow, who's right here on the very, very right, he's only, he got his PhD in 2014. So he's only been out like six or seven years and he's got 140,000 sites. So the volume of citations, the volume of research, the, the, the focus, the, the more, the more um, for, for deep learning, is, is, it's unprecedented what we're seeing. It is absolutely uh, mind boggling the amount of research and the amount of work that's being done on this topic. Uh, so, so those are the reasons why this, this deep learning focus is, is really, really a big, big, big driver of this, right? So we have this, you know, to summarize where we're at, we think we have this sort of paradigm shift where um, things are moved from what, what's possible to whether it's practical and valuable. 
And deep learning is driving some of this. And, and two of the main contexts where it's driving it, I should point out, are in uh, natural language processing and in image recognition, right? So unstructured data, that 80% that of all organizational data is unstructured. That's the classic sort of statistic we all say. Now we can tap into that like never before, right? So again, it's all about what's practical and what's valuable. So that's sort of the shift. And, and, it's, and I should point out with this shift, of course, comes the obvious question. Even in Canada, where all this really cool stuff is happening, if you go to the Canada AI website, uh, this is from a few months ago now, but there's all these cool, cool articles about the AI boom and all these collaborations between industry and academia, but then come some of the really important things like social good and job displacement, right? So suddenly all these governance questions are also coming up. And that's what I think is where the, the opportunity is for this sort of human-centered AI and analytics. Uh, now, another uh, thing, a very IT academia and maybe industry is to look at a hype cycle. So hype cycles, those of you that are familiar with it, is, is a, it's sort of, a, we're not familiar with it, I should say. It's sort of like the innovation S curve for innovation, but it's for technology. So this is something Gartner developed. And Gartner is a, is a company. Forrester is another one that has something similar. And so the idea is that technologies go through this sort of cycle where they have these peak of inflated expectations, there's hype around them. And then eventually they go through this process and then they kind of go to this plateau of productivity where they become mainstream, or in some cases they become obsolete before they get there, right? So the point is that these, that these dots are various AI technologies. This is an AI hype cycle. And in here, you can see things like machine learning, natural language processing, all these different things are on there. Computer vision, these are all things that are, are, are pretty much becoming mainstream or very mature, right? And this is from 2018, by the way. So now those things are way further to the, to the right here. But the reason I like to show this 2018 one is that this was an important year. And it was an important year because it was the first time ever AI governance entered the hype cycle, right? So the very, the, the most recent thing was AI governance on here. And this is important because, uh, and this is very standard in any um, innovative society, you're gonna get these innovations and then suddenly people are gonna say, wait a minute, uh, as these innovations are becoming pervasive, what about, what about governance, right? So, but the, the fact that now we have these speech recognition and computer vision and NLP, and now, hey, we need the governance on it. And governance here encompasses things like privacy, fairness, and, and uh, just, you know, how do you, how does, how should the technology augment the process? So all these different things come into play here. And so again, this paradigm shift means now more than ever, as we think about practical and valuable, governance really needs to be a big part of that. And, and, and governance is a socio-technical problem. And so this is why, you know, business schools, we, we study design and we study socio-technical problems. And, and we also think about downstream implications, and Dr. Shang's going to talk about that and a lot more. Um, so, so we're really well positioned, and we should be leading the charge on this, right? So now I've kind of set the stage for this paradigm shift. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, what, this human-centered AI idea. What, what does this mean, and, and what was the inspiration for what we're doing at, at Notre Dame, at least? And so the definition here is, you know, design, develop, and the application of advanced ML and user modeling methods to human generated content with the goal of improving the human condition, right? So a lot of good buzzwords, uh, like any good business school definition, you've got to have all the buzzwords, uh, value creation and, and so forth. At the inspiration for this, at least for what we're doing, we looked at a lot of other labs and a lot of entities. And we also looked at what we thought is needed to, to kind of make this happen. And a couple of uh, really good examples we came up with were first, uh, Stanford has this uh, human AI center and their goal is to improve the human condition. They're working on some really cool problems uh, around uh, disparities and, and helping uh, uh, sort of the, the most economically disadvantaged and how, how AI can be an equalizer to, to overcome these things. Uh, so that's a really, that's sort of the improving the human condition mission. And, and we're seeing a lot of this, right? I think at, in, in academia and industry, social good and improvement along these lines has become really, really critical. 
Uh, for those of you in academia, I think we all agree, our students, when we teach analytics, they, they want something more. They don't just want us to teach them methods. They want us to teach them the, the, the positive things that we can do with these methods, right? And so that's where this idea sort of comes from. And another one, the by design idea. I think design is absolutely critical to this, right? So, you know, if you think about governance, that means privacy by design, which is GDPR in Europe, but, but also fairness by design. And they talked about fairness a bit in GDPR, but fairness by design is now absolutely essential. We know that models can, can have disparate impact in terms of their performance. And, and I'll give examples of that in a second. Uh, and so this is an area, again, so, so as we think about these social technical multi-dimensional, you know, now making a model that works well and deploying it, whether it's an industry or in any, you know, pipeline uh, means you have to think about so many additional considerations, right? It's, it's a very complex problem. And so, again, I think, you know, business schools and universities in general are very well suited to, to help with that. The third entity that informed us, and this is one that I know is now getting all kinds of bad coverage and for good reason. I mean, there have been some really bad things that have happened at the MIT Media Lab in recent years, but uh, so not, our, we're not inspired at all by any of that, of course, but there is a couple of things that were really pow powerful ideas that MIT Media Lab came up with over the last 30 years. And one of them is this notion of anti-disciplinary, right? So, so anti-disciplinary might seem like a odd term. We're, we're all familiar with disciplines, right? So information technology is a discipline, marketing is a, perhaps you know, is a discipline, finance and so forth. Uh, and we're familiar with the idea of interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary where we work at the intersection, right? So FinTech, FinTech is at the intersection of say finance and technology. Anti-disciplinary is this idea that the disciplines come together and the sum is greater than the parts in, in that we're doing something that cannot be done otherwise. And so it's something that is not just, you know, a handoff where, okay, I'm gonna do part A, I'm gonna hand it off to discipline, the second discipline, which is going to do part B. So anti-disciplinary is where you cannot, you do things that cannot be done unless there's such a ubiquitous, seamless integration of those disciplines. And that's a really powerful idea that MIT Media Lab has pushed, which we're seeing increasingly in, in institutions. We're seeing so many more uh, institutes and centers across campus that where people are coming together, but the goal isn't just to do the handoffs, it's to look at problems in a completely different way. Uh, and so when we talk about things like technology ethics, or we talk about data and society, right? These are the types of problems that require an antidisciplinary focus uh, for both design and science. And so that's sort of the inspiration we think for this human-centered AI idea, which if you look around, it's already been you know, getting a lot of traction at these different places. So that's sort of human-centered AI. And so now I'm going to give a couple of, uh, conclude with a couple of examples of projects we're working on, right? So, so the time we've allocated for, so this, by the way, this is the Southeastern United States. And this, what I've colored here is actually uh, a region that's known as the stroke belt, right? So the reason it's the stroke belt is that, you know, th this keynote, I think these keynotes are supposed to be about roughly about an hour, including Q&A, and in this case, maybe about 45 minutes or so, but during the duration of this talk, there are going to be about 15 people in the United States that are going to die of a stroke, right? So it's a very unfortunate statistic, but one that we have, we have about 140,000 annual deaths from, from stroke. And the stroke belt region is, is where this happens disproportionately higher than the rest of the country. So it's people in this region it's the, the rate of incident of stroke is 50% higher than the rest, of the rest of the country. And it is a very good example, we think, of a human-centered uh, AI problem. And, and so let's start with what are, the, what are the causes of this, right? So the key considerations that drive this, the, the stroke here are diet and sleep, right? As we know, these are the big drivers of, of, uh, of the stroke. Uh, nicotine and alcohol, of course, are... If, if you, consumed excessively, of course, in the case of alcohol, it can be bad, and, and nicotine is bad, period. Um, anxiety and negative sentiment are also drivers of it. And finally, literacy and trust, right? So people's health literacy and their trust in uh, medication, trust in physicians, trust in the whole healthcare system, are, turns out, are really big factors, right? So people are um, have 
poor habits and they don't want to go to the doctor, right? And that's a bad combination. So that's really what's driving it. Now, and this is based on lots of research that a lot of folks have done. We've done tons of surveys of, you know, tens of thousands of people and interviews, and it's, it's all very consistent. So the question becomes, what can we do with it? And an example of the human-centered AI capability we're developing is this patient-empowered uh, health analytics platform we've, we've built. And it's uh, in Atlanta in partnership, and the leads are the folks at Emory University and Georgia Tech, as well as the Morehouse School of Medicine. And the idea is we have a, a, a panel, we have a cohort of users, and, and we have the, the, the main cohort is for cardiovascular disease, people at a risk. And a lot of these are, it's, it's actually younger African-American males. So these are African-American men in their early 20s. And a lot of these, this population, unfortunately, this, this specific sub-demographic uh, often gets stroke by their, by their 40s or I mean, they have CBD or, and they're at a high risk of stroke. And so given those factors, those antecedents that drive this, what we're trying to do is use mobile apps. Uh, we give them access to sensors. They opt in to, to share their clinical data with us. Um, and we're essentially pushing them notifications to try to get them to do things a little bit better and healthier. So literally, if we're talking text and sending them text messages and just to keep their doctor's appointments, right? So this is, you know, sounds cool. It's kind of antidisciplinary in the sense that the app design requires, I mean, we've got medical doctors, we have epidemiologists, we have community spe people specializing in certain you know, cultures and communities. We have a computer scientist. We have, of course, information systems, business school people because we're running field studies and trying to quantify value and whatnot. So it's a very, you know, it's a nice mixed team. But as we talk about that paradigm shift I was alluding to, it turns out that just building this in this day and age is not necessarily that, the most challenging part anymore. And in fact, uh, if you go to say the research triangle in North Carolina or other parts of the country, chances are you might even be familiar with some entities in academia or industry that are now building these types of platforms, right? With apps and sensors and whatnot for patient empowerment to improve patient journeys. So what's possible is no longer the big question. It's more, again, about what's practical and valuable. And so an example of that becomes, well, we're through the mobile app, uh, the people participating can elect to share their health information, right? And so they have to give us consent, right? A, a really challenging question in patient empowerment, especially when you're working with health disparate populations is, what does informed consent mean when you're working with a population that does, isn't very high in terms of its health literacy and numeracy, right? Can you have informed consent? So that's, that's one example of a, of a type of question around the art of the practical, right? So, so we have to make sure that we properly educate the users on what the implications are, uh, even though we'd love for them to share this data, but that might not always be in their best interest. Another example is around uh, fairness, right? So as it turns out, we're, in our case, uh, surveys are challenging to do constantly, and some of the key things around trust and anxiety require feedback from users. And as it turns out, NLP models can help. So we can actually score the text and try to use that information to infer people's trust and anxiety levels. But to do that, as it turns out, those models have fairness issues. And what I mean by fairness issues is that the models are all else being equal based on one's race or gender, they're scoring things differently. And that's sort of the textbook definition of bias, right? So if, if the only thing driving my prediction, the difference is, is the gender, everything else is the same, uh, just because of that one thing, or even if I don't have that information, but it's, it's, it's being implicitly picked up on, then we get into fairness issues because that's considered disparate impact, both based on GDPR and even based on uh, regulation that's going to be in the pipeline here in the U.S., right? Uh, but even more broadly, it's just, it's just, you know, it's just not ethical. So we have to make sure that those models are also fair from that perspective. And then finally, we're working with these communities and, and you know, it's, it's traditionally, at least in academia, it's very easy for us to think about uh, these folks as the N in, in terms of our statistical sample or the power. Uh, we're running A-B testing. We need a certain number of votes. But the question becomes, what's, what's in it for them, 
right? So if they are, what's the value that they're going to get? Uh, and so these are just examples of how this human-centered AI idea comes out. And I have some screenshots from articles we've written about this. For this case, we've worked with you know, Dr. Herman Taylor at Morehouse and came up with a set of guidelines for, first of all, when engaging with these communities, what should we be doing? So just, yes, AI can be really powerful for social good, but you know, is, is that the right thing to do? And so this is a set of sort of like a charter that we, we developed that we followed and it was actually you know, published in the American Journal of Kidney Diseases as well and uh, others are using it. And then same thing, we talked about fairness and we wrote an article in HBR describing our, our process for, for trying to make the models more fair and, and this notion that maybe we can have the cake and eat it too when it comes to fairness. We, could, we made models that were not just fair, but they were actually more accurate, right? And that's, that's, that's the tension traditionally. Uh, so these are examples of things. And then we also came up with a set of AI governance guidelines based on this project around uh, the concerns we had and we identified. So we're working with all these vendors on the IoT stuff and you know the benchmarking isn't always there. So there's all these little things to think about that go beyond possible to the practical and valuable. And frankly, a lot of these are, are research questions that even we didn't have time to delve into. Uh, where industry and, and business school partnerships like Lubar partnering with all its amazing you know industry partners in the area could help with a lot of these types of problems so so this is an example of, of the stroke belt project and, and to to kind of go go back to that you know dr Sheng's going to talk about value and so here we, we did run a b test to show whether our nlp models which are scoring the on a daily basis what what these uh as these folks are who have these apps and they're interacting with it. And what we did is we identified a group with low trust in physicians and we did an A-B test to see, hey, if we correctly identify them, if our models are fair and they're accurate, and if we push them notifications that can enhance their trust, does it, does it improve trust, right? And so here's sort of the results. I'm oh, sorry, this is, I'm gonna skip the NLP stuff here. Uh, that was just how we incorporated fairness into it. But here is sort of an A-B test on trust in physician. And, and of course, these numbers are still not super great. This is on a hundred point scale, but we basically identified this group and this is the first 90 days. So you have, you see an orange and blue. Those are, those are essentially the pre-test uh, values for, for the two groups, uh, the control and treatment group, uh, both of which happen to be low in trust. And so you see variance because it's a daily trust index. And after you're in the A-B test, based on those text messages, you see that it does sort of, you get this lift with the treatment group based, based on that. So this was sort of a very micro KPI in our case, because we're just trying to, over those uh, 90 days that we tested it for this period here, we're trying to see if we can get them to be more trusting of physicians through this, through this whole platform that I talked about. And, and during that time period, if they happen, they're more likely, of course, we, we connect it to whether they keep their physician's appointments, right, and stuff. So, so that's just an example of the, the whole process. But again, just uh, the, the things that we're thinking about now, which probably we should have been thinking about 20 years ago, but of course, better late than never, uh, are that, you know, what all these considerations just to get to this point, right, just to get the results. Uh, and this is part of a much longer project because now, these patient journeys are 10, 20 years. So time will tell if, if this works. But, but I think the takeaway is, again, for human-centered AI, the design, design elements, every model, everything we're doing, we have to think more broadly about design. It's very anti-disciplinary. And we're, we, think, we think we're trying to at least get at social good, as are many others. Another example I want to share is, which has gotten a lot of attention, is around fair applications of facial recognition, right? So this has been all over the news over the last couple of years. And so, you know, a lot of things have happened even in the last two years. We know that, again, industry is, is very central to this, right? So the top players in industry for facial recognition are Amazon's recognition, uh, Azure, Microsoft Azure's uh, face, and Kairos, which is this other, other startup that's done very well. And, and these vendors, and, and there's others that are providing that type of technology, like Clearview AI and whatnot. And, and there's a lot of uh, debate around what, how and when they should be used, right? And, and so, of course, over the last year, we know that Amazon and Microsoft and Kairos have all said, we're not going to use them 
or law enforcement applications, right? Where we're, we're just analyzing lots of data and trying to identify faces. And, and that's good because the model accuracy, even though they're 99.99%, when you're analyzing millions of faces, you're going to get a lot of false positives with 99.99%. Uh, and then there's all kinds of issues around the fairness of the models, right? I mean, a lot of research by a lot of folks has shown that these models are disparate, have disparate impact, right? They're, they're, they tend to be not as effective for women and certain underrepresented groups in terms of their identification. So, okay, so, so that's sort of, you know, facial recognition and governance stepped in and said, hey, this is great. But our work is looking at something slightly differently, which is that as it turns out, we are still, facial recognition is still used a lot. And, and even if you don't have algorithms, the reality is there are lots of processes where we need to recognize faces. A really good example of this is uh, in law enforcement is, is uh, when we develop a, a lineup, a police lineup, an eyewitness lineup. So with an eyewitness lineup, essentially we need to get a set of uh, faces that seem similar to the suspect. And these ones have to be basically, the idea is it's supposed to be what's called a fair lineup. That's the actual term. And so someone has to make a judgment as to which faces seem to be a fair lineup. And humans are, as it turns out, for no fault of our own, not very good at facial recognition sometimes. There's a distribution. Some of us are really good. Some, they're called super recognizers. They're off the charts, but other people are not. And so as a result, even in these processes, which are manually done, there is unfortunately bias. And this bias does get amplified. If I'm putting together a lineup of people that don't look anything like me, research shows that my likelihood of doing that effectively goes down, right? And then there's, a, and that goes back to uh, child's uh, developmental psychology, right? Where we, we kind of, what, the, what types of faces we see when we grow up has an impact. So the point is that there are situations where even in manual or psychological face recognition, as it's called, there's, there's potential for bias. And so an example of a human-centered AI project, which is anti-disciplinary, we're involving a lot of people, is, is this right here. And I know there's a lot going on, but basically it's quite simple. We're, we're, we, we know machine learning algorithms for have, you know, detect, they can detect faces and they can compare similarities. And that's where there's all these problems, right, with, with um, bias, algorithmic bias right here. But there's been all this research in psychology that's also looked at manual detection and similarity, and there's a bunch of psychological biases. So the question we're trying to answer is, okay, yes, we know we don't want mass uh, facial recognition running wild all over the, all over the, the web or whatnot, and you know, privacy and, and bias implications, but there are situations where we need to recognize faces. Can machine learning algorithms help us understand psychological bias better, right? So if we, because unfortunately, the best we can do is fMRIs and, and, and other things and brain activations when we're doing this and, and rely on people's accounts, but algorithms do have some value in terms of tracing and so forth. So we're looking at collaborations with, with or industry and even law enforcement where we're trying to say, how can we use augmentation to improve fair lineups for eyewitnesses where, where people are just relying on human intuition right now. And, and so I'll, I'll leave you with a motivating example of this. All right, so this is a, this is a classic task in psychology uh, where this is called the choice task. And the choice task, uh, people are given three pictures and they ac actually, the middle one, and the question is that which of the two faces on the left or right is most similar to the one in the middle? Right? So that's the task, and we're not going to do it for this face here, but I'll give you one in the next, next slide. So here, this is, this is the face, and so the idea would be, is this gentleman on the left more similar, or is this gentleman on the right more similar to this one in the middle? Right? And so here's an example. When we do this task, the results, what they tell us is when we compare algorithms to humans, and, and here there's a, and, and I'll, I'll skip all these, there's a lot of bar charts and line charts here, but here's the, here's the big punchline here. For human effectiveness at facial recognition, there's this thing called the Cambridge Face Memory Test, or the CFMT. And the higher you are on your CFMT score, 72 is a perfect score, that means you're really good at recognizing faces. 
And so what, what research, ours and others, shows is the best human face recognizers are the closest to the algorithms, right? So the average person is this, this right here, and this shows agreement with algorithms for, for these tasks. And so it's maybe about under 60, under 70%. The best are, and this one shows about 77%, but in some cases, even as high as 90%. And that's important. So even though, yes, these algorithms are very biased, but it's, it's worth noting that the best facial recognition algorithms are as good as or better than the best recognizers, right? So, so there is some potential value in their usage. We just need to figure out the best way to use it so that we're not doing terrible things, right? And, and so, and then we also see race effects there where in some cases, yes, these I mean, algorithms are biased, but the human bias can be even much greater when you do cross race comparisons, right? So in this case, if you look at, uh, you know, a cross race would be like if, a, if someone is white is looking at a picture of someone who's black or vice versa, their performance goes down. And this is based on, there's been lots of research, right? And so I'll give you an example to kind of leave you with this. So here's an example. Oops, and I was supposed, sorry, I, was, I, I think I've given away the punchline a little bit here, but these, these things that popped up, those weren't supposed to show up. But uh, so basically though, and so we'll just, we'll, I'll just tell you then. Um, here, again, same task, face on the left or right versus the face in the middle. And as it turns out, if, if I had asked you this and without giving you the results here, the half of you would probably have said that this face looks more similar to this one. And the other half would have probably said, this one looks more similar to this one. In fact, more humans tend to think this looks more similar to here. And as it turns out, the majority of overwhelming majority of algorithms find this face more similar. And the reason is, as humans, we are much more fixated by hair, facial hair and, and hair length and so forth. Whereas the algorithms are better at looking at jaw structure, uh, jawline, nose and other structural features because they're trained on algorithms often on data where people have different hairstyles, right? So celebrity, they, they might be trained on 50 images of Brad Pitt. And so he's got 20 different hairstyles going and, and boom, it's just very different. And so it's interesting. And, and that's an example that's used of human facial recognition bias, right? So the big question around all of this, again, a human-centered AI question would be, you know, how can we use these models to augment and perhaps train and improve human facial recognition ability because but for in, in situations where we have to do it, like in law enforcement lineups, can the algorithms and the feedback they're providing on what we think improve, help us improve our ability to do it? So these are just a couple of examples that we've give, of, of tried to share with you of this idea of human-centered AI. And oh, and by the way, here's a, this is one cool thing you can do with algorithms. You can do run traces. So this is showing us what the, the deep CNN models, the deep learning facial recognition models, what they're looking at. And they're doing this comparison. And so they're seeing this jawline and, and eyes and, and, and face structure. And th these look very different from this perspective to, to, the, to the algorithm. So they kind of exclude the hair. They kind of look at the mask, if you will. So anyway, I'll conclude now, and I'm, I'm running out of time here. Is So we've launched this human-centered analytics lab. We're working on all these projects. And at Notre Dame, this is part of a much broader university-wide ecosystem. Right? And, and I mentioned that you know, and to do this type of work, we need that. So our lab called HAL, we're paying homage to uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, where if you haven't seen it, HAL is, uh, which is by the way, uh, was a kind of a play. HAL is one letter shifted from IBM. So in the 60s even, uh, Stanley Kubrick, they were making a criticism of potential these supercomputer mainframe companies and the dangers of just relying on technology blindly. Right, so anyway, HAL, our, our lab, and we're working with, of course, the facial recognition and, and all these things with AI. Uh, we have to work with the computer vision labs, the data inference labs, but then you know, and, and we're working with folks in quantitative psychology, uh, the data science. So we have a Lucy Institute for Data and Society focusing on data science for social good, uh, which has an applied analytics lab. So we're partnering with industry on that as well. And then ethics very, very critical to all of this. In our ethics, we include folks from law, we include folks from philosophy, uh, social sciences, and, and, and of course the business school and, and, and computer science and whatnot. And so that's a critical piece to all of this in the technology ethics focus. So that's kind of uh, my spiel, if you will. So we want to focus again, the important, the takeaways are the importance of 
design and sort of this interdisciplinary or antidisciplinary aspect, I think is critical. We think business schools have a lot to offer. You've got to pick and choose your spots. And of course, you know, try not to boil the ocean. So that's sort of, that's what I've got. I'm sorry, I know I'm up on time here. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot the, okay. So Michael, sorry, Michael, I'm, I'm looking at your question here. Um, was Turing the engineer that called his computers bronze goddesses? I, I, I can neither confirm nor deny. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, he was definitely very eclectic. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Yeah, so how do we develop a mindset to apply the right analytics technique to solve our business and social problems right now? Um, to fail. Oh, so failure in AI projects. Um, and many non-AI answers are as good as AI-driven ones for many problems, yes. No, so this is really good. The second question, I, and I think uh, Dr. Shang's talk on value will be really helpful here as well. But yeah, there is a lot of hype. And, and um, you know, for any project, I would say you start with simple models, machine learning models first, right? Um, the, the most powerful predictive machine learning method, if you go to Kaggle competitions, the, the method that's winning most Kaggle competitions is, is the decision tree models, uh, XG boost, gradient boosted trees, which are, again, very powerful. For most non, for most structured data tasks, that's that's all you need for prediction, at least. But yeah, it does vary. So I will unshare, and I know we're right up on time. Dr. Sina, do we have time for any questions, or are we done? Or yeah, are there any more questions for Dr. Bassi? Thank you so much, Dr. Abbasi. It's a great keynote. And uh, we'll have the next uh, session, which is the industry panel, uh, start in a couple of minutes. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure. Hi, good morning, uh, Dr. Hightower. This is Anupam. How are you doing? Uh, good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good to see you. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, where are you located? I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Ah, that's nice. <clears throat> I think that's one of the advantages of these virtual sessions. It's a lot yeah. easier <laughs> to say yes, right? right. It's, it's no longer three days for a one-hour session. Yeah. I have some friends who teach at San Francisco State. Oh, um, neat. neat. I'd love to go and visit uh, them. It is nice. You know, I, I lived in the Milwaukee area for uh, you know, close to a decade. Oh, yeah? Uh, so certainly I can appreciate the difference in the seasons between these yeah. two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have seasons. Well, San Francisco, yes. San Francisco has seasons too. It has yeah. uh, the foggy it season is. and the light season, right? <laughs> The city certainly has it, right, with all its microclimates here. You know, <laughs> the city might be at 60 Fahrenheit, and in the South Bay, we may be boiling at 100. <laughs> okay, I think it's 10 o'clock, so I think uh, we should go ahead and get started. Um, okay. Hold on, let me switch that. All right, um, the next uh, um, event we have here is a panel on artificial intelligence and analytics and practice. Um, 
My name is Ross Hightower. I'm the director of the SAP University Competence Center here in um, the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, I think we have a great selection of panelists. It should be really interesting. They represent a diverse set of uh, industries and they have a, uh, their positions give them very different perspectives on this, I think. So I'm gonna introduce them. This is in alphabetical order. Uh, first off, we have uh, Dr. Anupam Dada Majandar. Uh, he's the head of global R&D for Viar Medical Ven Ventilation. 20 years of experience with uh, companies like OmniCell, GE Healthcare. Uh, he's also been involved with um, setting, helping to set standards for safety and uh, um, uh, ultrasound, right? Uh, that's what it was. <clears throat> that's right. We have uh, Brian Eusebio, for, uh, Vice President of Business Intelligence and Analytics Manager for Associated Bank. Uh, with nine years of experience. Gary Johnson is the Vice President of Data Science and Head of Milo Labs at Mortgage Guarantee Insurance Corporation. Uh, and I'm hoping he's gonna tell us a little about, about Milo Labs. It sounded like an interesting concept. <clears throat> and Scott Names, who's the Vice Pre Senior Vice President of Shared Services and Chief Information Officer for Church Mutual Insurance Company. All right, so I think what we'll do, um, is, let me unshare here. How do I get, oh, stop sharing, there we go. <clears throat> okay. I think what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna go in that order and each one of our panelists will do a short presentation, eight to 10 minutes. Uh, and then uh, at the end, we'll open it up to questions if you want to ask a question, you can enter it in the Q&A uh, app that you find at the bottom of uh, the Zoom application. Um, and uh, so we'll start off with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dada Majandar. Great. Hey, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Hightower. I appreciate the kind introduction. And uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Atish uh, Sinha. Uh, for the invitation uh, to join this panel. Hey, look, it's exciting to be here uh, to share my experiences uh, over the past three decades of uh, attempting to use uh, AI and analytics in uh, healthcare. Uh, and I'd say it's, a it's been a journey of learning, right? From uh, many failures and a few successes that I like to think are as transformational. So as they say, sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. And that's very much the world of uh, analytics and healthcare. Uh, now, the world of AI in healthcare has really been filled with uh, much hype. Uh, in the keynote, Dr. Basi talked about the Turing Award winners. Uh, and there was an interesting incident uh, about seven years back when uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who's the uh, pioneer for deep learning, if you will, uh, was at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And he said, hey, you know, he was addressing the radiologists. And he said, hey, look, it's quite obvious to me that, you know, we should stop training doctors to be radiologists because it's quite obvious that you guys will soon be obsolete, right? And that certainly served as a lightning rod for the radiology community that kind of got its act together as the American College of Radiology set up their data science institute. But look, uh, you know, as you start talking about AI in healthcare, uh, you know, you feel like you've got the world's eyes on you, right? The clinical community, will, you know, once they get excited or worried, depending on their perspective, start asking a series of questions ranging from, are you gonna replace me? Wow, you know, I really need this help. I'm in a tier three geography in a emerging market. I don't have any physician here. Uh, I'd love to get AI here to help me. Uh, and once they get past that, hey, AI can help the doctors, it often gets into the arena of saying, explain it, right? I don't like black magic. I'd really like to understand what's going on behind the scenes. And only then will I put it into clinical practice, right? Uh, and then there's certainly this wow factor that comes with some of this black magic aspect of AI in healthcare, right? Uh, 
Now, you know, one of the uh, you know, challenges of this, of course, has been the hype that's been created and Dr. Basi shared the 2018 uh, hype cycle from Gartner, right? Now, every time I attend a board of directors meeting, uh, you know, the, once the topic of AI in healthcare starts, you know, the, often the question is, hey, why won't this hype cycle lead to waste of millions, right? We'll give you another 5 million this year and will we get something for it? And to be candid, a lot of money has been frittered away in lofty promises in healthcare that have not materialized. Right? So one of the challenges of AI in healthcare has been big promises under delivery, right? We are still uh, you know, in this world, if you will, where the doctors and the patients continue to struggle uh, with the mess that healthcare can be. Uh, so how do we really look at these very fragmented, siloed world of healthcare and figure out where are the pockets of excellence? How do we reduce waste? How do we really have an impact on patient care at the end of the day? Uh, so this morning, uh, you know, I'll talk about my journey in this world of, you know, attempting to use AI in healthcare. Uh, along these goals of the booms and the busts of healthcare. Uh, you know, as Dr. Abbasi said, look, AI is not necessarily new. The connectionist paradigms have been there since the 60s. You know, in the 70s, we had the first AI venture. And then in the 80s, you know, AI started coming back. Now, my journey in this world of uh, AI, uh, which we really call advanced analytics and machine learning back then started back in the mid uh, 90s when I was a graduate student at the University of Washington. Uh, my first experience was around leveraging analytics for bioinformatics, looking at autoimmune diseases, and then later on in my doctorate work in medical imaging. Uh, as the dot-com boom hit, I had the opportunity to join a medtech startup and leverage AI more in looking at cervical cancer screening. Right? As the dot-com bust happened in the 2002 timeframe, uh, you know, I moved to uh, beautiful Wisconsin and came to Milwaukee to be part of GE Healthcare, where for the first few years, I was doing a lot of modeling work around uh, medical ultrasound. Right? How do we characterize the millions of possibilities of medical ultrasound in various fields that get created as part of uh, this really innovative technology. Uh, one of my more exciting experiences was when I was had an opportunity to go to the emerging markets. I was based out of China and India, and we were looking to see if we can really help the midwives, uh, help the moms to be figure out where the birth of the baby is going to be. Can they give birth to the baby at home, or do they have to go into a facility, a clinical facility, which might be 30 miles away? Right? Uh, certainly my work at uh, corporate research, when I led research for all of healthcare at the labs up in New York, we had so many different opportunities where we leveraged AI for predictive analytics, digital twin, in a range of topics from MR, CT, life sciences, as well as healthcare IT opportunities. In 2018, uh, I moved back to Silicon Valley uh, and started working as a CTO for Omnicell, where we looked at medication management robotics and the analytics around it. And you know, close to a $750 billion opportunity there, if we can really manage medicines better in our health systems, uh, just in the United States. And more recently, my current work, uh, you know, I feel fortunate to have the opportunity uh, to really focus on the pandemic that's ongoing as part of my work in ventilation and respiratory care. So I'll take a few of these examples. And since this is a discussion with the students, faculty, and interested parties in the business school, I'll really focus more on the why and the impact uh, that healthcare uh, has the potential with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and related analytics techniques. 
So with that, uh, you know, there are three key themes that you'll see through my discussions. Uh, first, you'll see work uh, on data at the edge, uh, particularly how can we leverage uh, IoT and what we call the industrial IoT. The second theme you'll see is around re-engineering the workflow. Uh, and that's easier said than done, right? And finally, around coordination of care. Now, how do we really help the patients have the impact in really the messy, fragmented, siloed world of how healthcare is practiced today. Uh, so let me start with the mid nineties. Uh, you know, this is the time when the human genome project was pretty big. Uh, and as part of that, you know, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Professor Leroy Hood's group where look, I was an electrical engineer and I was trying to understand biology. Uh, and one of my challenges was I was trying to figure out what was the basis for the autoimmune disease, uh, the animal model for multiple sclerosis. Right? Uh, and honestly, it was a lot of you know, hard, laborious, painful work for those of you with the background in biology, you know how much work it takes to sequence a gene, which you know, honestly has got transformed in the last 20 years. But the data would look something like this, right? We would be sequencing genes, we'd be isolating these genes, and then looking for variances in this to understand what is the basis for the immune systems attacking the body. Right? Now, from that world where I you know, started looking at a lot of this data and using some analytics techniques, some of the early days of NLP, you know, more recently, if you see where this world has come, you know, November 2020 was just a, a inflection point, if you will, in the role of AI in biology when Google's DeepMind unit uh, you know, came up with a graph theoretic machine learning technique that could predict the protein folding structure. Look, this was a problem that back in the 90s, we'd say is one of the most intractable problems in biology. And we, here we are, you know, mere 30 years away when you can leverage analytics going all the way from the sequences of genes to predicting what its structure could look like and this had a role to play in the vaccination success story, if you will, in selecting the candidates for vaccines, uh, at least in the UK. Uh, so a massive transformation in the biological sciences with AI, and this is just the beginning, right? We are just at the tip of the iceberg. Now, late 90s, uh, you know, my doctoral work was looking at the upper GI tract, there was an interesting uh, headline in the Wall Street Journal that said, mystery disease strikes affluent white male, right? And that was all around Barrett's esophagus, which is the cancer of the food pipe, if you will. Right? And today's, the technology back then was essentially doing an upper GI endoscopy where a physician puts in this one centimeter tube, right? Has to knock out the patient, has to sedate the patient, and you start looking at images that you see on the right. Uh, my hypothesis there was, look, if you have to move this into a screening environment and automate it, how can we look at the visual perception that the physicians have and do that in an automated manner? So these were the early days where you know, I was trying to train a neural network, uh, you know, a three-layer network, 25 nodes, maybe a thousand training set, and I'd kick off the job and go home for the night, right? That's how slow things were. If you look at where that world has come today with the edge analytics and AI, now you can essentially swallow a camera pill right? and that pill is going to transmit the health of your gut as it moves through your body. So this world's getting transformed too. And certainly the edge analytics and edge AI has a significant role to play. Uh, you know, one of the more exciting arenas that I've had a chance to have an impact on is the world of medical imaging. Uh, and some of the devices that I've worked on really looking at the emerging markets, the questions where, look, we can look at the babies when the mom is in the hospital. Right? But what if the mother cannot get to the hospital? What would it take? How do we predict that you know, the baby's health is fine, the baby's growing well, and it's time now to go to the hospital. 
And this was an only time, and let's say in the 2007, 2010 timeframe, collaborating with the scientists at GE Research. You know, we looked at many of these medical imaging, uh, ultrasound images, and looking at these images, measuring the diameter of the head, the length of the bones, the length of the fetus, looking at elliptical fit, if you will, for the belly of the fetus, we could start predicting what's the fetus gestational age, what's their health, when is the expected delivery. And if you look at the classical techniques, based on such images, a physician would look up OB tables and predict, hey, the baby's 38 weeks of gestation and he or she will come out on this day. My personal experience, they were very confident that my daughter would be eight pounds at delivery. Uh, they forgot that they were using tables for Caucasians, which I obviously am not. And when she came out a healthy baby, but she was five pounds. Right? So again, using patient-specific data, leveraging medical imaging, huge opportunity of where analytics and AI can have a transformational impact. You know, one of the fun topics uh, and research areas that I had an opportunity to do was can we transform medical imaging and ultrasound in particular and take this 400 pound machine, make it small enough, miniaturize it so it fits into the hand. And we built this product called the vScan Access that released in about seven years back, where essentially you could go into rural geographies. This is an example in a Puskesmas in Indonesia, right? where you can figure out if the mom can give birth at home or does she have to go into the facility? And I'm so proud of this team that very recently released the first wireless dual-headed ultrasound system that can essentially help a ER physician or a EMP to figure out what the emergency response needs to be for the patients by looking at their body. And again, huge role for analytics here, a huge role, especially for edge analytics, and it's going to be real time. So those are some of the challenges that we are facing, but the technologies of today are certainly creating an impact in many of these fields in healthcare. Another exciting arena in there uh -huh. was, if you've got a less experienced user, how do we help them to get great images? So you've got telemedicine that assumes that you've got great quality images and you can do a remote consultation. But how do we help this less experienced user get a great image right up front? So in some ways, if I'm less experienced, you know, I'll keep looking at my textbook to figure out if I'm doing the scan right. Can we bring the textbook onto the machine itself? So this was work that we did about 10 years back in building an algorithm called Scan Coach that guides a less experienced user in terms of how to position the ultrasound probe so they can get great quality images. Uh, so another exciting arena where edge analytics, edge AI really helped us give real-time guidance to the bedside clinicians. Anupam, I hate to interrupt you. It's actually fascinating, but we have to get to the other, uh, other presenters. Awesome. Uh, so let me get to the wrap here then. Uh, you know, other examples that uh, we can talk in the Q&A session around drug shortage. I'll wrap this up with just a key takeaway that you know, certainly the world with large data sets, hardware acceleration, the new machine learning frameworks and the open source movement is transforming this world of healthcare. But really the jobs to be done in this world of healthcare in some ways remain largely similar. What's really changing are the BHACs, if you will, the bold, hairy, audacious goals around personalized medicine, around operational efficiencies, this dream of reducing the cost of healthcare and certainly the breakthroughs that we have seen just in the past year with the rapid selection of drug therapy candidates. Uh, so thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions in the panel session. Yeah, thank you. Um, so our next presenter is uh, Brian Eusebio. Brian? Hey, good morning. Hopefully you guys can see me. Can you guys hear me? Yep. yep. All right, awesome. So let me share my screen. And hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Uh, yeah, we can. Perfect. So uh, so thanks everyone for having me this morning. Um, 
as mentioned, my, my background is much more heavily focused on businesses um, and cloud AI based uh, like in CRMs and gathering big data for making better business intelligence and business decisions for our group. Um, so what I really wanted to start by doing was just kind of taking it at a very high level. Um, so cloud-based analytics opportunities today are projected to grow um, by a compound annual growth rate of about 23% to 2025. And there's a lot of growth factors that are driving this, right? So uh, as mentioned today, you know, there's a really big push for AI technologies. Uh, and as we start to go into more smartphone adoption, 5G technologies, and really being able to harness the power of these uh, speeds for internet, um, you're going to start seeing a lot of cloud-based technologies and analytics start to kind of propel into the future of um, harnessing that data. Now, it'd be hard for me to kind of pass up on the fact that uh, the last year had uh, COVID-19 and the impact that that had on our global cloud analytics market. And arguably, you know, I'd say that for most businesses, I think COVID-19 really pushed um, these technologies and broke down barriers that were historically in place. Um, you know, I, a lot of people that I've talked to and especially, you know, um, us at Associated, you know, we had to make a drastic change and start working remotely. I mean, obviously this isn't in person, this is over a Zoom uh, call as well. So we did a big push into starting to gather our data and push that into more of a cloud, allowing our uh, sales folks and allowing our groups to better utilize our data models and better utilize uh, like data lakes um, to get that data quicker and make better decisions. Uh, the one negative I think is if you are anywhere in the hardware space, um, you know, with chip shortages and everything that's going on right now, uh, obviously to, to the slowdown um, to get the and acquire the hardware, uh, it is having kind of a negative effect because, you know, I, I joke all the time with friends who aren't super um, knowledgeable in the cloud space, you know, this, this information is being stored somewhere, it's not just going out into the cloud. So uh, obviously that has had a negative impact, but I think the positive um, impacts on our on the analytics market um, have been more so being able to adopt these technologies faster and seeing the value in these technologies. So from a market dynamic standpoint, um, some of the drivers you're seeing increasing data connectivity through multi-cloud environments. Uh, so it's sometimes not even just based, especially you know, for the companies that I've worked for, it's never really been based around one cloud environment. Uh, it's getting those different cloud environments to talk to each other. Some of the restraints, uh, I would say this is probably the biggest pushback I get when talking to uh, executive members in, in trying to get the buy-in and that's security and privacy. You know, I think there's a limited understanding on the security and privacy concerns for some of your proprietary data. Uh, people get a little nervous when it starts leaving kind of your core system. So uh, that's one of the big restraints we see. I think there's others that are, uh, especially in the cloud dynamics um, area, but you know, for the most part, I'd say that's probably one of the bigger restraints we start to see. And I think this kind of brings apart uh, opportunity though. When you start to look at in-house uh, equipment, it is starting to become antiquated. Um, you know, you're starting to see that shift go into the cloud dynamic because it's a lot, in some cases, a lot cheaper. It really depends on the situation. Um, but having that in-house expertise, it, it can cost a lot of money. You have to have somebody who can do the data science, quote unquote, uh, and have it in-house. And finally, the challenge, just traditional technology and data warehouses, as I've kind of mentioned. Uh, some of those systems become antiquated. They do require a lot of upkeep as well. So why make the switch? So I always like to kind of start, um, and I'm going to start kind of, that was kind of the 13,000 foot view, and I want to start to bring it down now. Um, and, and I think the big switch for a lot of folks, especially when you start looking at businesses, um, is your employees and your salespeople really need more personalized insights, actionable insights, and historically, these insights have been backward looking. A lot of times you might get, you know, somebody at a higher level and they just want to have, you know, how have we done, you know, where are we really going? And some of that is hard to get. So I like to show this picture because you have your, your data wranglers, the people who collect the data, uh, and then you have your analysts who are there to build the visual visualizations. And I think sometimes those are kind of a hybrid role. You might get someone who plays a little bit of both of those. Uh, then you have your, you know, historically data scientists who build the models, and a lot of this now is starting to move into the artificial intelligence platforms, 
Um, so you don't like historical data scientists who were crunching numbers and maybe needed to know code. A lot of this is starting to move away from low code to no code. Um, and you don't really need folks that really need to build those specific data models. And then finally you get to your IT department. And I love the little hook on there that says full because anyone who's probably been in a business knows that it seems like the IT groups never have enough resources uh, and you're always battling with them. So that's really where the integration comes in and the cloud suites a lot of times um, allow you to better um, get those integrations with those applications. So finally, some of our challenges, you know, when you're considering kind of a holistic view, I find this almost at every business that I've worked for. Um, and, you know, honestly, it's that customer 360 is a big buzzword. I think that's from Salesforce and, you know, other companies use uh, different buzzwords. But really, when you're looking for that holistic view of, you know, of your customer, uh, especially from more of a cloud platform, what you're really looking for is something that can kind of touch all lines of business. So you have something that the business executives can come in, see where the pipeline's going, how our portfolio is doing, what our employees up to, you know, what's working, what's not. Uh, then you can get your risk and compliance department. And it kind of goes all over. So uh, I can tell you, you know, at, at Johnson Controls and also at Associated Bank, um, that whole quote unquote customer 360 was big because we really wanted to start to um, grow our share into can our branch and call centers start to have influence on what customers are doing. And we really start to get that holistic view of our customers. So um, by doing this in the cloud, obviously, you know, it saves us a lot of time because uh, not only is our data not housed, it, you know, we don't have to have so many physical individuals, you know, in-house, we can, um, you know, have them be all over the place, which is a huge benefit. So some of the questions typically you want to answer when you're looking for that customer 360 approach, I would say the big ones are, we want to have proactive engagements, uh, grow our wallet share, focus on where are the best businesses, and then being able to coach people and manage performance, right? And, and the really the big questions when we look at that are, how do we drive revenue? How do we deepen our relationships? And how do we create, create our customer or increase our customer experience? And I would say that between native analytics and AI um, from like a customer relationship management standpoints, uh, you can really look at this in three tiers. I would argue that you could probably expand upon this, but this is typically, um, I would say for my experience, the three tiers that it comes to, and that's data and CRM platform, and that's gonna be the start of it. How do you get your information into a central location? And based on, you know, hopefully this low code or no code, you can increase the user experience by making it, whether it's on mobile, um, which I'd argue is probably the biggest now that everybody's really working from home, um, native out of the box apps. So you don't have to have somebody in who can develop and code. Um, a lot of this is a lot of click and drag and, and, you know, you don't need super expensive individuals to build these out for you. And then finally that augmented intelligence uh, or AI, um, you know, no code machine learning, being able to have, you know, data sets that can get pushed through and get really tangible uh, information out of it without having to code um, any machine learning uh, and then better predictive analytics. I'd say that's a huge, huge positive is the predictive analytics piece. So again, I wanted to take this very broad. I obviously could dive really deep into this um, and I'd be happy to answer questions uh, on my experience as well. Um, but you know, I, I definitely see the future of data being housed more so in the cloud um, and I'm excited to, uh, to be a part of it. Thanks, Brian. Um, actually, that's fascinating to us at the, on the uh, UCC. We are dealing with that transition to the cloud as well. Um, yep. Uh, okay, so next speaker is uh, Gary Johnson. Gary. Hey, good morning. I'll get my video up here in just a second. Make sure it's, uh, there we hey, go. Dad. I think everyone can see me. Good, how are you? Good. Great, thanks for having me. All right, uh, give me a second. I'll share my screen as well. And then uh, go ahead and get started. There you go. Great, okay, thank you. Whoop. Oh, wrong there. All right, I'll put that in presentation there. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you again for, for having me today. Excited to speak to the group. Uh, Brian probably gave some reasonable lead-ins into some of the things that I'll cover 
uh, in the short, the short bit that I'm talking about today, but uh, really overall going to be talking about um, how we're accelerating data and analytics at MGIC. Uh, and maybe first, before I start to go into that, uh, MG, I'll maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, who is MGIC? Uh, we are a, a private mortgage insurance company uh, here in Milwaukee. Uh, we qu kind of quietly live uh, right up downtown on Water Street. For those of you, if you're familiar with Red Arrow Park, uh, the ice skating rink, uh, we're the two buildings right above Starbucks. So uh, right here in the community. Uh, and and uh, we've been in the private mortgage insurance business for over 60 years, uh, really enabling uh, home ownership uh, across the country. So, uh, you know, a, a very important mission. And along with that comes a lot of exciting analytic opportunities uh, to support our business, support our customers uh, across the nation. Uh, interesting problems to tackle from uh, everything from pricing strategy to risk management. Uh, we want to drive value through our sales and marketing change, uh, chains. And uh, that creates a lot of, a lot of really, I think, exciting and interesting problems that we have to solve as a company. Um, so in, in probably a little bit, roughly a year, year and a half ago, um, I think we really wanted to have a focus to build on our existing data and analytics capabilities, uh, and accelerate those and, and recognizing that I think every year that goes by the way that that world is changing moves, seems to move faster and faster. Uh, and so we, we started, uh, a new initiative or, or department, uh, called Milo Labs. And really, that's focused on, you can think about it as creating one team. And what we were really looking to do is break down some of the traditional barriers that we might have, uh, especially in a, you know, a relatively mature organization such as ours, um, between, engineering, between engineering, data science, business intelligence, uh, information governance, and, and really, really position those to, to advance us into the future. And you know, a, a big goal of Milo Labs is not just the delivery. Uh, we get to work on really interesting things and are focused at delivering value for the business, but also a forward-looking view on things such as architecture, tooling, talents, and, you know, really our mission is to continue to evolve that um, as we go forward and, and make sure that it's sustainable um, for, for our company and that we're able to leverage new opportunities in that world to drive, to drive business or to drive business value for, for the company. So uh, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time really on, on why, why I think that's really important, um, especially with a lot of moving pieces and similar, I think, to speakers today. You know, we're also making um, a you know, material move to the cloud presence. Um, I'm, I'm fairly fortunate. My, my team is somewhat greenfield uh, in terms of the way we get to operate. So we're almost exclusively uh, working on AWS right now, uh, you know, really enjoying that and laying down some, some great groundwork. But uh, really in terms of engineering patterns and when we talk about wanting to do analytics at scale, uh, creating patterns across kind of all those, all those silos that I mentioned before, whether it's data engineering, model operations, the data scientist team, the business intelligence team, it, it's really, really important to create what I would call consistent scalable patterns uh, so that as we want to move from having one model to hundreds of models or, you know, thousands of models, it's something that we can easily manage. And, it, it, you know, a good example I would have as a, a, a fortune of being able to connect with the head of engineering at, at a major fast food um, chain in the country. And I, and I think that they, one thing they highlighted for me is they had various data science teams scattered across the organization. And I'm sure there's a number of data scientists on this call that that have very uh, very firm views on what they like for tools, IDEs, things like that. But um, when we actually take it to putting it into practice and into use at an organization, really being able to align on some of those things or what allow us to, to move fast, um, manage things in a good way, consider the governance perspectives. And so what this has afforded us to do is, for, you know, for my team, uh, the, the data scientist team, the business intelligence team to really um, – what you'd think of as your traditional uh, information services organization work very, very closely with folks such as the data engineering team uh, to be able to create a, what I would call a, a really a low ramp delivery um, to for repeatable architecture, modeling, and processes. 
And, uh, that, you know, as I stressed, I think that that's incredibly important for us um, to be able to advance that speed. And then additionally, as we bring on new capabilities, um, establishing those patterns early are what allow us to be able to move with those very quickly and, and expand the breadth there. Um, and, you know, and as I mentioned, I think the, the cloud really provides, and Brian highlighted some of this in the last presentation, um, a lot of great opportunity for repeatable architecture and processes that we can scale quickly. Uh, so we've really been enjoying making, you know, heavy use of kind of the, the Amazon, if we want to call it the, their managed service data science stack. So making heavy, made, uh, heavy use of SageMaker, Glue, Athena, um, tools like that. And, and we're, we're really excited about the results and the progress that we're making, uh, making on those fronts. Um, you know, and I think another another really point, important point um, for really accelerating our progress with data and analytics at MGIC comes down to talent diversity as well. Uh, so MGIC firmly has and always believes in diversity in the workplace, and that, that's really a core value that drives our daily work. Um, but as we take that a little bit further, when we think about a, a data science team, I think, diver and, and analytics in general, diversity of thought, um, backgrounds, whether those be academic and industry are incredibly important. I, you know, I kind of, I'll kind of joke that a lot of what we're doing fundamentally at the end of the day, it ends up being a math problem. And as we look at different areas of sciences um, or, or industries, there, there are a lot of interesting ways to solve problems and maybe an example of that would be, you know, we, we uh, as an organization, we, we have an underwriting organization. So we, we have to insure loans and we review those to make sure that they're the quality that meets our, um, that meets our underwriting guidelines, uh, as an example. And you could liken that very much to a production process. It's not, it's not in a lot of ways at a high level, it's no different than making a car. Um, so as we've, we've explored talents, we've really brought it in as we've been building up the Milo Labs organization from a variety of places. Um, going along those lines, we have people with backgrounds in mechanical engineering, psychology, uh, computational mathematics, and we've covered industry experience from ad advertising, retail, um, Department of Defense, and, and really that diversity of thought, I think, on just the way we tackle solving problems um, is one of the most exciting things that I see. Uh, as we as we start to do our work on a daily basis, and and I think as we we go forward, we continue to look for to, to augment that talent. Uh, we've talked to people in the, the astrophysics space, um, and we're you know very open. Those are those are some of the most interesting conversations. And again, no different than exploring new infrastructure tools, technology, um, expo exploring new talent, and really diversity of thought on how we can solve the problems for for both our company and our customers. Uh, as we go forward. And, you know, building on that talent diversity, um, I think a really important, really, I think what I've been talking about is kind of building on and accelerating our analytics, data and analytics practice at MGIC. And um, one, I think, really exciting way to do that, and, you know, I'm excited to be here today, uh, would be exploring acceleration partners. And a couple, um, a couple really good examples of that, uh, that we've, we've, had discussions with would be UWM as an example. Uh, we're excited uh, to be talking about things such as Industry Connect, partnering with the Data Science Institute and, and talking with them a little bit about maybe what the possibilities might be for engagement. And, and again, I think that goes to the diversity of thought. There are other places outside the walls of MGSC that we can look to, again, add value for the firm, add value for our customers. And, and I think those are really fun, exciting, and, and great ways to, to augment what we're doing as an organization. Um, so that's kind of my, my brief overview of just what we've been standing up and the way we've been approaching growing uh, and accelerating our data and analytics practice in MGIC. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to wrap up there or if, if we're going to save questions for the end or take them now. Uh, yeah, we'll do the questions at the end. Uh, yep. Yeah, that is interesting. The emphasis on the diversity of backgrounds, that's fascinating. Uh, to me, anyway. Uh, okay, uh, the, our, our last speaker is uh, Scott Names. Scott? Uh, good morning. Uh, I will just share my screen here and then we get going from there. Thanks for having me. I will get started. Okay, Ross, all good? Yep, I see it. 
Okay, great. So uh, again, good morning. My name is Scott Names. I'm uh, currently an SVP and Chief Information Officer at Church Mutual Insurance Company. A, a real brief background of the company, we were formed in uh, 1897, so that makes us about 125 years old. Uh, what we do is really specialize in, in religious organizations as well as schools, senior living, etc. We're the largest writer in these markets, uh, and we insure um, somewhere over 80,000 physical structures in the forms of churches and schools. We write commercialized products and we're an, a, an A-rated company from an AM best standpoint, meaning we're financially very strong in our industry. What I wanted to talk to a little bit about today was really an application, uh, an application view of what we're doing uh, in terms of AI analytics and, and specifically I, some IoT applications and some predictive modeling. So I'll, I'll jump into those uh, real quickly. If time permitting, I'll talk about some of the things that we aren't doing, but overall the property and casualty insurance industry is doing, many of which you're, you're probably using yourselves. Uh, so one of our, our, our most interesting uh, IoT applications is really our wildfire program. We have a multifaceted driven solution. And uh, what we do here is we, we come at it from a monitoring, <clears throat> a prevention and a defense standpoint. I'll talk a little bit about each of those. So from a, a monitoring perspective, you can kind of see a map here. So we, we do monitor our customers. Again, we have customers in 50 states uh, in, in excess of 80,000 um, customers that all, uh, for the most part, have physical buildings and structures. Unfortunately, many of which are in, in California uh, and, and in wildfire zones. And so what you can see here is you'll see we use a software called RZ Alert to monitor locations. Right now, we're we're able to monitor at all 50 states, but we're focusing in California, Colorado, and Oregon. That's where you hear about the fires and, and uh, that's where the propensity of the fires here are. So in order to do that, we use alerts um, generated through a proprietary algorithm, which again is all data based in real time. And that looks at things like fire size, fire containment, forecasted weather conditions, and distance to our policyholders. Uh, what you can see on this map is you can see those blue dots those are our customers at this particular moment in time. And this is real data. In this image, the orange perimeter, uh, or I should say the yellow circle, so the broadest circle, that's really the threat area. So that's where we think this, this could go. And as you can see, there are some blue dots in there. So those would be structures in our case that would uh, most likely be burnt to the ground. And then as an insurance company, we, we replace those structures uh, with the premiums that have been paid. So you can see the yellow circle is really the threat area based on artificial intelligence and all the data that we can pull together. The orange perimeter, uh, which is inside of the yellow perimeter is the current fire line. And we have an incident commander that looks at that as well as um, uses the data. And that tells us really where the, the fire is burning currently. And then the red squares are the hotspots. And we use satellite imagery uh, to detect uh, the length of time it's been burning, the heat, and a number of other factors. So we can kind of tell where the heat of the fire is and, and again, where the fire is burning. And again, our job as an insurance company is not to pay losses when bad things happen. We have a real obligation to prevent bad things from happening. And that's really what, what our core business is. So in this case, we'll talk a little bit about how do we, what do we do when we know this? So we see there's a fire, it's burning through California. We've got insurance in, in the burn pattern. And what do we do from here? I'm trying to forward here. Okay, so from a prevention standpoint, um, you know, obviously what we do is we identify high hazard locations. We have a 50 point scale. Um, and we look at, uh, we look at this not only just for three states, but really all the states. And, and so far in our, in our history of the last couple of years with the the high degree of wildfires we've had. We're really looking out in the Western states, Colorado, Oregon, California. But if this starts to be a problem in say Wisconsin, we can apply the models there as well. We have the data, we have the vendors, but we use the 50 point model um, to determine the hazard. And then we look at the history as well as the top topographical hazard maps and other things like that. So uh, what you can see here is um, some scoring algorithms. And as we determine these things, we work with our customers uh, to help them prepare in the event that they have this situation going on. 
So from a defense perspective, this is what, what happens when they're when the fire is burning and there's an imminent danger. So this is this is actually what we do. Uh, when we have a one of our customers uh, locations threatened by a wildfire, we'll actually defend the customer. So we will not only observe, monitor the customer, then we'll try to create prevention for the customer in terms of what can we do to prevent the loss. But once the loss is imminent, we'll actually deploy fire trucks. So here you can see um, on the left-hand side, you, you can see a map that's basically um, has our locations in it. So you can see the, the blue symbols are the 10 different trucks deployed. Uh, in this case in California and the red obviously is the fire. So at this particular time, and again, this is real data, real, real life stuff coming from last year's fire season. We've got 10 trucks deployed around those fires. Now you see other fires where we don't have trucks deployed. And, and I, I will tell you that from an industry perspective, there's more demand than supply in terms of, of fighting these types of losses. But you can just see here how we're deploying trucks. And then what these trucks do is they drive out, they clear brush, they install sprinklers, they move things, and, and ultimately they spray the buildings with a non, with a foam that's supposed to prevent them from burning down. So that's really the, the prevention side of it all. Getting to the business results. So what, what, is, what comes of all this? So these are our 2020 numbers. Uh, so the number of fires we monitored in just three states last year, ranging from mostly California, Colorado, and Oregon, we monitored 352 fires. Uh, we dispatched uh, to 23 fires, which were the most serious of the bunch in, in, in terms of our locations. And we, um, we had a so total saved insured value of, of just over 124 million. So that means had we have not done what we had done, we would have expected somewhere in the neighborhood of $124 million in property damage via uh, you know, churches, camps, and schools burning to the ground via the wildfires. And, and obviously we still incurred some losses of just over $14 million. Those were things that we either can't get to or our efforts weren't enough to save the buildings. So that's a little bit on what we do from a wildfire perspective. Again, very AI driven, very technology driven, using everything from satellite imagery to on the ground data to heat sensors and, and all of those things. I want to talk a little bit about a, another program that we use IoT, and this is a sensor program. So as I mentioned, we're the, we're the largest insurer of religious institutions across uh, the United States. And with that means we have uh, in excess of 80,000 churches that we insure. Um, those of you who are familiar with a church, and we, we insure all denominations, so it could be a, a temple or a synagogue or any, anything of that nature. Um, many of these buildings are vacant during the week. And so what we found over time is that uh, when things are vacant, um, we oftentimes don't know about a loss until it's three days later, or it's, it's not not in a good position to fix it. So we, we created a program working with Roost, uh, who's an IoT and technology vendor to create sensors for our buildings. And so I'll skip through this slide and really get into um, what does it look like? So at, at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're using data and analytics to determine which of our 80,000 structures are most at risk for uh, freezing was our first uh, case. Cause uh, we have a lot of churches that are in climates uh, southern climates that don't expect to freeze. But as you all uh, would have noticed in Texas in February, uh, a lot of things froze, uh, including pipes and those cause water damage. And then we, we pay for those damages. So we have uh, created a program uh, coupled, partnered with Roost, uh, a technology vendor to uh, create sensors for our churches. And so these sensors detect ambient temperatures and they send text messages to our policyholders that allow them to go in and either turn up the heat or try to mitigate the damage. And so that's really the, the gist of the program. So you can see uh, what we've done over time is this, this slide is really uh, two phase here. You can see losses averted is really the, uh, the data coming off of the X axis on the bottom. And then the trend line is the installed base. So you can see we continue to create the installed base starting back in 16 all the way up into the fourth quarter of 20. So we continue to install more units uh, and we continue to avert more losses, which is not just a win for our company in terms of profitability, but we're really saving structures from being flooded, from being frozen, from being um, all of those things that you, you never really want to happen. But when, when they do happen, we're, we're here to take care of that. Uh, you can see on the right, the life of the program, we've got about $36 million in saves, meaning if we hadn't installed these sensors, we'd have an additional 
not only $36 million in losses, but you think about all the aggravation uh, when your structure, whether it be your home, your building, your office, your church, your school, has been flooded and now needs to be rebuilt. So that's a little bit about the results of the program. The last thing I'll talk about is what we've uh, done in predictive modeling. And, and this is the one we've been at the longest, really started this in 2012. Um, you can see some financial numbers here. We've grown uh, the gross written premium of the company to over a billion now. That's about 86% up in that nine year period. Uh, net written premium is up 94% and surplus, which is our, our really our, our oxygen, it's how we run our business, is up almost 100%. How have we done that? Well, a large part of that has been through predictive analytics. And I'll, I'll talk in, in generalities here about how we get there. What we, what we do is, is, as you would imagine, is we take internal data that we know, we've got the largest database of customers in our, in our religious sector, sector in the world. We take that and we couple that with external data and we merge structures and dimensionality uh, we create predictive methods using AI and, and all of the things that the, the previous speakers have spoken about. And then a real important box is the one on the bottom right. Uh, we run it by people, uh, meaning underwriters, claims personnel, um, our business intelligence unit to make sure that it makes sense, right? I mean, the, we do a lot uh, with data and analytics, but at the end of the day, there's still a human element of that. And, and, and that's what we use to ensure that what we're doing um, makes sense. And then ultimately, I'll show you what it's done in terms of our, our lift in terms of pricing and differentials and accounts. So it's a busy slide. Um, I'll break it down. And, and this is um, about my last slide. But you can see the, uh, the y-axis is premium in terms of how much we might charge. The x-axis is number of policies. So in this example, we have 10 policies and we have premiums. If you can see before the model, uh, pre predictive model we created, everything was priced fairly the same. And so you can see that uh, in the blue lines, we just 10 policies, they all got the same price. <clears throat> we use predictive modeling to differentiate the pricing. And so now you can see post model, uh, we've got the red line where you're seeing some, price, some prices are very inexpensive and some prices are more based upon their analytics. So you can see we've really been able to differentiate. So for us, that's been a huge, um, a huge boon in terms of uh, giving our customers the right price and being able to be profitable as a company. And that really, um, it really is all that I had. So we talked about wildfires, sensors, predictive analytics in terms of uh, pricing and profitability. And, and in terms of our industry, which is property casualty insurance, um, many, if not all of you have, have been, are, are familiar with telematics. And then we also use uh, smart home devices and, and then digital partners. Um, to, to again, uh, not only protect our policyholders, but help our company grow and thrive. And that was all I had. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> um, well, we only have a few minutes left. <clears throat> um, actually, a question occurred to me, something that Brian uh, mentioned, I think, uh, perked my ears up. And that is when he mentioned that uh, uh, no code kinds of applications um, what, what kinds of uh, talents do you think, uh, some skills that, as an educator, this is something that would be interested, I think, to a lot of our uh, participants. Um, what, what kind of skills or educational backgrounds, what kind of things can we do as educators to get uh, students ready uh, for uh, these fields? And, and do you find it difficult finding talent? Um, I'll start with you, Brian. Yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic question. I, you know, I think so I, I can speak for myself on that. My background is super unique. Um, I really started in the, the technology field in sales and sales and recruiting. Uh, got a passion. It was always kind of my passion as a hobby. And, and actually, this kind of goes to someone had asked a question as well on um, that I answered for myself, but I don't know if anyone else has experience with these, but using uh, either Docker or Ansible to provision some of your servers. Um, I've never had any experience with it, but um, except in my personal life, but anyways, uh, getting people ready. I think, you know, from an experience standpoint, yeah. So I'm, most of my experience is in the Salesforce world. Um, and they are really moving heavily into what they want to call low code slash no code. Um, and, you know, in terms of, of getting ready for that Salesforce, I can speak for their behalf, you know, it does a fantastic job on doing training. 
Um, they have a website called trailhead.com. Um, and you know, outside of that, I mean, you can basically do that and get your certifications. Um, so they do a really, really good job with that. Um, and they offer tons of classes and most of it is free. Um, in terms of getting people ready for it, you know, I think, you know, there's definitely different development languages out there. When you look at AI and machine learning, um, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways you can go. It's kind of a loaded question at this point, but, um, you know, just in general, when you start to talk about like data sets, you always hear SQL. I mean, there's, there's languages out there that you're going to hear, uh, and different technologies as well. So I don't want to take too much time. Cause again, my, most of my experience has been focused on, uh, you know, Excel. And then I moved into, um, mm. into Salesforce. So I'd open it up to the, the rest of the group. Uh, Anupam, what do you think? Yeah. Look, uh, you know, I, I come very much from the research side of the world, right? So I think Brian's comments are great. Certainly the move to the low code is key. Uh, I think learning some of the analytics frameworks and, you know, much of this is available now on uh, online courses, right? But I would highly recommend that, you know, folks interested in the area get some experience with AWS, get some experience with Python, and get some experience with TensorFlow, it's really going to set up our students really well for the future with those skills. Great. Uh, yes, yeah, Scott. Yeah. I was gonna say, I'll chime in here really quick with that as well, is, is Python is something I think that is extremely valuable. It's some, those are resources that we're constantly um, trying to find at Associated right now. Uh, and, and I think that definitely has a, a lot of potential in the future. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Scott? I would say from an, um, an academic institution, make sure you have advisory, whether it be a panel or a group with business people on it. Um, because you can talk a lot about what technology you, you ought to use, but we sit on a couple of university uh, panels that help shape the curriculum for different programs. So there'd be an IT program, a cyber program, an AI program. And, and although we don't have all the answers, we, we sit along with other businesses and help you uh, tell you what we're looking for in demand, which is ultimately we're the, we're the demand for your supply, right? You're, you're training and bringing up students and we're, we're the ones hiring them. And so we, we always enjoy being part of those discussions because we learn a lot, not only from peer companies, but also from the academic institutions that can teach us how to think differently. But I would definitely say have that advisory team that helps you to shape that curriculum. Yeah, I agree. I, I've always found the advisory boards to be really informative. Um, Gary, what do you think? Yeah, I would generally agree with all the comments. Um, uh, Brian's comments on, on Python, Scott's comments, I think, on the, the advisory uh, role. And then the, the, I think the only thing I would just add to that conversation, too, are, are tools such as, I think, what Brian was referring to in Salesforce. Um, I think they, they also change a little bit maybe the way the data scientists work. So there, there still is a, you know, the, the quality of the data and what you feed to it still, all of that still counts. So I think just maybe it, it changes the, some of the work that's done just where it happens in the pipeline. And it, I, I actually view it as we get to spend more time thinking and focusing on what we should be putting in there um, as opposed to building the model as well. So um, it just it continues to evolve those roles. And, and, I, and I would agree with Brian, I think Salesforce is doing some really nice things to that generically need to happen in a lot of places and it takes it off of off of everyone's plate so it's very beneficial great uh well we're right at 11 o'clock um so i think this, that's the end of the the uh, panel i don't i, I want to think i uh, take another five minutes that's fine so we have okay. another five minutes because so we have a break after this um all right there so some we have questions in the q a box Right. So one of the questions is for IoT projects, how would you manage the massive volume of data? And I think that was probably uh, uh, targeted at Scott when it came out. Um, Do you see that question for the IoT projects? How do you manage the massive amount of data? Yeah, uh, without getting uh, into, a, into a super technical discussion, uh, we, we do a, a lot of it. Um, in-house, but we also use partners. So the wildfire program that I talked about, we use Red Zone um, and their, their uh, capabilities coupled with our capabilities. So it's not about server space and speed, it's about